Drunk driving has long been an issue here in New Mexico, but some see an opportunity to address the root causes of addiction instead of sending repeat offenders straight to jail. In Bernalillo County, the DWI Recovery Court focuses on treatment, rehabilitation, and accountability. Our producer, Sarah Gustavus, reported on the program earlier this year. So first, let's go to the court to hear from a participant and a parole officer and see Judge Edward Benavides in action, checking in with people in the program and celebrating a graduation. Without this program, honestly, I would either be dead, in jail, or in some institution, or living off of somebody. My nickname is Pepper. Mr. Morgan, what's going on? Dan, come on up. What's happening? I've been in the program almost 18 months. A little longer than most people, it's just a 12-month program. There are different situations and circumstances that warrant me to have to be here a little longer. You know, I need to get my driver's license. I need to get insurance. At the same time, I need to operate a restaurant. All rise. The Metropolitan Court in the state of New Mexico is now in session. The Honorable Edward Benavidez is presiding. Jail is costly to taxpayers. It also does not provide, you know, tr treatment while the person's there. They're just basically in a cell block and m maybe not getting the resources that they would get um, on the outside. So I think the goal really is actually to keep them from jail because it's, it is two parts, one for the you know, common citizen of Albuquerque and also for uh, the defendant themselves. So, but if I hadn't have been in this program, man, I, I wouldn't even be in business. I wouldn't have anything. I wouldn't have nothing. This program it really helps with the recidivism rate in New Mexico, really addressing the, um, you know, repeat DWI offender crisis that we do have. It's great when it combines both treatment, supervision, and the resources that these people need to better themselves and not um, find themselves in the situation again. Ultimately, this program is about getting sober and maintaining sobriety. At some point, the, this cycle change came, and, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I started looking forward to doing AA. I've been going, also, I've been going to AA every single day for the last five I did have a relapse last June. Uh, I drank some beer last June, and I wasn't supposed to. Um, I immediately contacted my probation officer the next day. I did a urine, urine analysis, extreme scramble urine analysis, ETG, and uh, I got sanctioned for six weeks. For, for six weeks, I took an ILP class, intensive outpatient program, and that was just another counseling course that added on to the, my curriculum of my daily things to do. It's kind of a fine line, because on the one hand, you want them to feel comfortable with you, but on the other hand, you have to uphold what the court has asked you to uphold. So when you do have to ask for a sanction, um, it's, it's, it hurts me because I, I don't want to put see somebody in trouble or relapsing, but I do have a responsibility to this community. And so I try to stress that to the defendants that I work with that I'm here to you know, support you in every way I can, but I do have to you know, do my job and uphold what the court has asked me to do. There are relapses that occur and we take them in stride. We understand that this is a part of their recovery um, and it's not meant to punish them for when they have a relapse. It's meant to give them that extra support, whether it be through treatment or supervision, um, so that further down the road when we're, you know, 180 days in, they're making the right choices uh, to not use substances when something occurs in their life that they normally would have in the past. I think for me this program represents balance and strength. Um, that's what my sobriety represents to me. I could be incarcerated for the 15 months that my charge for driving while intoxicated held because it was my third. Or I could be out here working on myself, making an investment in myself through counseling and through the evolution group, and that, which, give, which has given me a whole different outlook on life. All right, Mr. Hill, I have your judgment form here. It reads as follows. With respect to the charge of driving while intoxicated, a second offense, uh, you have 364 days of jail. You have seven days of pre-sentence confinement credit. Meeting. Congratulations. Uh, I want to tell you, Mr. Hill, that it's, uh, I'm really happy that you had an opportunity to come uh, to the program and uh, go through this again. Um, when we had our discussions, uh, I think that you've uh, really taken everything very, very seriously. And you look like you're just doing fantastic. You've come such a long way. Uh, so you've done a lot of hard work. 
and I'm, I'm just really proud of your efforts. Amanda. I'm joined today by Judge Edward Benavides, who's been with the Bernalillo County Metropolitan Court's DWI Recovery Court for more than two years. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having us here. Also, Daniel Blackwood, Executive Director of the Evolution Group. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Sarah. And you're working with the clients, the folks who come through his court. We do. We have a marvelous staff that uh, teams with the probation officers, the judge, the DA, the public defender, and all work together with these clients. Judge Benavidez, when folks end up in your court, they're, they're facing punishment for a drunk driving offense. Not their first, maybe their second or third. How does someone end up in your court instead of a different court? They get screened for participation in the drug court program. So uh, they have to have had you know, one prior offense and then they um, get assessed and see if they're compatible for the program. The alternative is gonna be uh, going into jail for a period of up to 90 days or even up to a year. So, What, what makes them compatible with your court? Well, the, it's for the repeat offenders and the recovery court program uh, has been here in Bernalillo County for the last 20 years. So it's a program that we've had and have had great success with over the years, uh, but it's uh, based on you know the, uh, the issues that they have with alcohol use and abuse. Do they have to want to go into re recovery and stop drinking? <laughs> Nobody wants to start off with us you know, when they come into the program. Uh, really, they're given a choice of coming into the program or going into a jail, incarceration. So uh, you'll hear from many of the graduates, you know, when I first started off, I didn't want to be there, and that's the general consensus. And Daniel, do folks come to you for, or maybe the counselors you work with for a first session, feeling a little resistant? They're being punished by being in recovery court? Well, uh, you know, the program exists as an alternative to jail. So it's not uncommon for people when they're first getting into the program to go into it because they, they don't want to go to jail. So it's not that they're really motivated to stop using or to really change their life. They just don't want to go to jail. So that makes for an interesting first meeting, right? <laughs> yeah. mixed, mixed motivations and ambivalence about being there. How does that change how you work with folks during the program? Well, I think we go, open, we, we go in with eyes open, knowing that, and I think acknowledge that openly and work with what's here rather than pretend that it's not there. And uh, so there's um, you know, a way of being real about that that gives a person the opportunity to really talk about where they're coming from. And you know, in many ways, this work is one big, giant motivational interview. So if you meet a person where they really are, right in the middle of their ambivalence, and work with them there, they, they'll, they'll start to move. Whereas if we have to all put on airs and pretend, it doesn't go so well. Judge Benavides, I sat in your court recently and I noticed that it did seem very real, very much more casual than I would have thought. These folks coming up and checking in with you about their progress in the program. Tell us, what, is that intentional? Oh, absolutely. You know, we want folks to be in a relaxed environment. So we want to uh, have people in a situation where they are able to work on their issues and recover from these types of, you know, alcohol abuse issues. So uh, the tone of the court is one of acceptance uh, for, you know, the reasons that they're there and trying to really get them in a situation where they're comfortable so they can work on these issues, which are, you know, obviously very difficult issues that they have to deal with. Um, so the whole atmosphere is one of really acceptance of, of why we're there and what we're working on. And we really strive to make it as, you know, as comfortable as possible, uh, you know, given the, the environment. Why do folks clap when you call people's names up to the bench? Oh, it's really a, a form of encouragement, uh, acknowledging that they're here in a recovery court and it, just acknowledging their willingness and their participation to take this on. It, it's a tremendous task to deal uh, with recovery from alcohol abuse issues. So everybody just acknowledges um, everybody's participation uh, when they're there at that time. And they have to come in every two weeks to check in with you. They're also checking in with their probation officer. If folks relapse, if they have a stumble, what happens? You know, uh, for a lot of these folks, relapse is inevitable. It's part of the disease that they have, the alcohol issues, abuse issues that they have. 
So what we've done uh, since I've had this program you know, the last two and a half years is move away from um, punishments because relapses happen. And, and you know, there's varying circumstances, of course. But as these things occur, uh, they're treated or, or they're set for more treatment uh, with counseling, uh, with the, the counselors at Evolution. But um, we don't want to punish folks because these issues come up. We want them to accept responsibility. And they're given a whole variety of tools to deal with these issues uh, with their counselors. And as long as they have integrity about the issue, they're being honest with us and willing to continue working on it. The last thing that we want to do is put somebody in jail. Jail serves no purpose uh, as far as rehabilitation goes. So we want to use that as an absolute last resort. And it does happen, you know, uh, but that is not what we're, that's not what we're about. We're about getting people comfortable with the rehabilitation process, the recovery process that allows them to, you know, get out of the situation that they're in and better their lives in general. Daniel, have you noticed, is there a difference in this level of accountability of you have to check in with the judge, you could go back to jail. Does that change the counseling side of things, of, of how you're working with the court and how maybe people view the experience of working with a counselor? It absolutely does. Uh, you know, in many ways, this model is kind of the hammer meets the couch. And the way in which we work together uh, as an interdisciplinary team. So when people have hope and when they have encouragement, you know, positive things happen, right? It's just like uh, with a plant, you give it a little water, you give it a little sun and it, it grows. Um, you know, if you punish the flower, it's not gonna grow. It's, it's uh, I mean, maybe it'll become a bonsai, but chances are it's not gonna help. So what happens here is we're, we're teaming and trying to find solutions, encouraging, and, and you were alluding earlier to relapse and how, it's helpful to understand that addiction is really an adaptive coping mechanism. It's the way that that individual found to cope with things. So relapse happens after stress has gotten a little higher. So a person might be bumping along all right in the program and then they encounter some stressor like stressors we would encounter. You know, uh, our moms get sick or there's a divorce or Someone there's a car accident. Someone mentioned a funeral accident. in Judge Benavidez's court. That's a really exactly. time. Exactly. Yeah. And that would be a time when in the past, without all this structure and encouragement and, and support, a relapse would occur because that's the way the person knows to cope. So in this structure, they feel bolstered. And a lot of times that won't happen. And then when it does, it's an opportunity to learn, all right, how could we, how could we deal with that differently? We've heard in recent years that young people in New Mexico are experiencing a lot of trauma. Some studies have come out that have shown that our young people experience very high rates of trauma. Does that feed into this problem of high DWI rates, addiction, issues like that in our communities? Well, I think that uh, in the field, we're just recognizing, I think as a society, but in the field especially, we're recognizing how big a role trauma, let alone PTSD, which is um, the diagnosable condition that can result from trauma, um, plays in the development of an adaptive coping mechanism like addiction, like a compulsive behavior. It helps people who are feeling afraid or powerless to cope. So um, your question, I think, is more about youth today. And I think that, um, you know, because we hear so much about things going on in the world, kids today may be more frightened, may be more uh, aware of the things that are going on. And so that's scary. That can be a form of trauma. Then there are the other more, um, usual things that come to mind when you think about trauma, right? Uh, physical abuse or emotional abuse, which were always ongoing. It's not like those things weren't happening 10 years ago or 15 years ago. But our ability to recognize, identify, and respond to them are improving. Yeah, it makes you wonder if, if young people, the folks who are experiencing addiction now, if they experience that but no one was looking at it you know, 20 years ago. Uh, Judge Benavidez, your program towns a recidivism rate or people who go back into the justice system of only 5%. How does that compare to the average? I think it's roughly 5 to 6% nationally. There are many uh, DWI drug courts across the country. Since we've uh, been working with the program uh, two and a half years, we have, we'll have our 
282nd graduate, I believe, this Thursday. And uh, to this point, we have had one person reoffend that has picked up a new DWI violation from all of our graduates over the last two and a half years. So they run our recidivism rates every three years, and uh, we have just been having just some tremendous success as far as folks, you know, not picking up new violations. So I'm looking forward to when they run our rates, they're going to be lower, you know, I think a lot lower than, than the national average. But even, you know, at five or six percent, that's a tremendous recidivism rate considering folks that are not treated, don't have the ability to be treated. Um, and that really is what, you know, leads to repeat offenses. You can have somebody sitting in jail for a year, they're not going to receive treatment, they're not going to understand uh, the issues that lead to their abuse and not be able to deal with it. So this uh, opportunity to participate in this program, it's just so valuable for the community. It's a huge community safety issue that is actually working and we need more of it. Uh, right now, do you have the budget to serve everyone who wants to participate? Right now we do. Uh, we are funded with federal grants. We received $1.6 million uh, and that covers a three year period. We used to get $275,000 of state funds. That has been reduced. It, it's getting lower and lower. And it really just doesn't make any sense to cut funding uh, from, the, from, from any source. It costs $21 a day to have somebody in the recovery court program as opposed to $121 a day to have somebody that's in jail. The cost savings is tremendous. The, the community safety issue is tremendous. And these types of programs just make the most sense possible for anybody that's looking to save money and to safeguard the community. And Daniel, to end, uh, do you think that there needs to be an expansion of these kinds of, of drug recovery courts in New Mexico? What would that do for our state? Well, yes, I think that this model works so well and could be, be utilized in many other areas, other jurisdictions. Um, I would love to see it extend to populations where a, a lighter form of it could be used in an early interventive way, uh, uh, for one. For two, there are many people who still get adjudicated, uh, you know, in the, in the traditional sense and don't get the opportunity to participate like um, Judge Benavides was saying. So it would be great to see it expanded and, and that opportunity be given, being given to um, other parts of the population that need it so much. What do you think about folks who say, you know, they're, they're worried about their families, their communities. They don't want folks to have another chance. They, they want them to go to prison. I mean, right. there's an argument for saying we want these people to be locked up. What would you say to them? Well, unfortunately, what we know about that is that when people go and they are housed with other people who are ill, they only get worse. So um, unfortunately, what that thinking is short-term thinking. I understand it. I understand that people want to feel safe. I do too. But when addiction is the source of the issue, if you treat that, what you see then it, as um, Judge Benavid has pointed out about the recidivism rate, is they don't reoffend. So you're actually safer if you treat the causal issue, which is addiction. I appreciate both of you stopping by. Thank you so much for giving us some more information about how DWI Recovery Court works here in Bernalillo County. Thank you so much for having us on. I really appreciate the opportunity to get word out to the community. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah.